Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Rebecca Marquez, Business Intelligence Coordinator with PMMI. Today we're going to hear from Chris Steele, Research and Consulting Economist with ITR Economics. Chris will be covering the findings of PMMI's second quarter 2018 Quarterly Economic Outlook Report. Chris is an economist at ITR Economics. He provides economic consulting services with a great deal of insight and action-oriented advice for small businesses, trade associations, and Fortune 500 companies. Chris has also brought in-depth insights of industry trends to the ITR Economics team with his willingness to go above and beyond in his daily research for our clients. Chris graduated from UMass Amherst with a BA in Economics and served six years in the National Guard. His attention to detail, ability to understand a client's specific needs, and organizational skills create an enjoyable partnership with each of his clients. Today, Chris will interpret the information included in the quarterly outlook and provide insight on how today's economy may be affecting your packaging and processing operations. If you have any questions that you would like to ask Chris, please type your question in the chat box that is located in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. At the end of the presentation, which will last approximately 30 to 40 minutes, he will answer your questions. At this point, I would like to hand the webinar over to Chris with ITR Economics. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you for uh, everyone for coming here today to our Market Forecast webinar. Um, for those of you that have been tuning in for the last few quarters, uh, the structure of today's webinar isn't going to be um, too surprising for you. For those of you that are first-time listeners, uh, a, a quick update on, on what we're looking at going over here today. Uh, first, we're going to start off with a little bit about what's going on in the U.S. macro economy right now, kind of the state of the union and how the economy stands. Uh, we're going to look at our uh, economic outlook for the next two or three years and some of the evidence that supports that before diving into some of the trends specific to PMMI. Uh, after that, we're going to zoom out a little bit and look at some of the, the global economic trends that are going on and some of the, the international growth drivers and international growth hindrances that we can be expected to see over the next, again, two or three years. But before we get into that, if I can get this, there we go. Uh, before we get into that, I want to go a little bit over our terminology and methodology. Um, ITR, as a long-term business cycle consulting firm, uh, does look at the economy in a way that is sometimes heterodox or a little bit different than you might hear um, on the headline news organizations or from other consulting organizations. Um, so I'm not going to drive this point home because I know a lot of you are familiar with our work here at ITR. Uh, but the two primary metrics that we look at uh, in our research, either when describing uh, corporate trends or macroeconomic trends, are going to be our data trends and our rates of change. Our data trends are our three-month moving total, our 3-MMT, uh, or our 12-month moving total, or 12-MMT. Those are our, our quarterly totals or our annual totals. And basically all those are doing is summing up uh, your monthly data into quarterly and yearly totals to help smooth out some of that data. Um, as a long-term business cycle consulting firm, we don't want to get lost in the weeds of month-to-month -month volatility and trying to interpret what amounts to essentially uh, noise and random chance. Because of that, we like to look at those long-term moving totals to get a better uh, understanding of where a company or where an industry or where the economy as a whole is going in general. So for those three-month moving totals and 12-month moving totals, we also have our rates of change analogs. These are our 312 and 1212, which is our quarter over year and our year over year rates of change. Uh, in general, we use the 1212 annual rate of change for benchmarking both corporate and economic activity. Um, and as a rule of thumb, if I'm talking about uh, any rates of change without specifying, I'm generally talking about this annual rate of change. And the reason I'm generally talking about this annual rate of change is because ITR defines the business cycle, again, both for corporate activity, industry, and macroeconomic activity, um, by your 1212 uh, and by what the 1212 is doing. So you can see down here on the bottom of our screen, we have ITR's business cycle. And for those of you who took finance or business or economics in college or high school, um, this isn't anything highbrow or surprising for you. But you can see that we break the business cycle down into four main phases. In the bottom left-hand corner, in blue, uh, in the bottom left of the sine curve, you can see we have the first phase of the business cycle, phase A, recovery. 
Phase A is defined as when your 12-12 is below the zero line, so things are contracting on a year-over-year -year basis, uh, your sales or your industry is declining. However, that 12-12 is moving upward toward the zero line. So the pace of decline is diminishing every month. This is kind of the light at the end of the tunnel phase of the business cycle because while things are tough, you can start to see the potential for rise on the horizon. As that 12-12 breaks through that zero line, we transition up into green here into phase B accelerating growth. Uh, this is the best phase of the business cycle. Uh, whatever metric we're looking at is rising on a year-over-year -year basis, and the pace of rise is accelerating uh, on a month-over-month -month basis. So your growth rates are going from 3.8 to 4 to 4.5% four every year, uh, every month, um, and, and things are very good. Uh, however, those paces of acceleration obviously can't last forever, and at some point that 12-12 will reach a peak and begin to fall back down toward the zero line, and that brings us over to this yellow portion, phase C, slowing growth. I like to think of phase C as the cautionary phase of the business cycle. Things are still good. You're still expanding on a year-over-year -year basis. You likely are building a strong backlog of orders. Your profitability figures are looking very good. You might have more work than you know what to do with. However, if you're not paying attention to where you are in this business cycle, if you're not looking toward your rates of change, you risk focusing on all of that positivity and not realizing that your 12-12 is falling down toward the zero line. And once it crosses below that zero line, we're in phase D recession. Um, I don't think I need to explain what phase D is for any of you. Um, so when I reference the four phases of the business cycle, phases A, B, C, and D throughout this report, um, always feel free to reference back to the slide because this uh, describes in a little bit more detail what I'm talking about. <coughs> so now, where is the U.S. economy right now? Well, one of our primary benchmarks for U.S. economic growth as it relates to you and the members of PMMI, we have U.S. industrial production. U.S. industrial production comprises three main segments of the economy, mining, manufacturing, and utilities production. Uh, right now, we are feeling very good. We're in phase B, accelerating growth up not quite 2.5% year over year. Uh, we expect to see some acceleration into the third quarter of 2018, uh, where we'll rise to about 2.9% by the end of the year before falling into a mild industrial recession in 2019. While negativity will characterize 2019 as a whole, by the time we get into early 2020, we will be in a phase A to phase B trend, and 2020 is looking to be a fairly strong growth year. Now, color or kind of characterizing the economy in that, uh, in that way of thinking of that phase B to phase C transition later on in 2018 before a slowing growth trend gives way to a mild recession in 2019 is really kind of the, the mindset I want you in throughout this report. Uh, overall, 2018 is shaping up to be a very good year, uh, but you do have to remember that, that that crest, that tipping point, that inflection point is on the horizon, and we'll look at a little bit of the data that supports that uh, before we move forward. Now, if you've been a long-time listener at ITR, and if you tuned in for our uh, market forecast update last quarter, you'll know that we were talking about a mid-2018 peak for industrial production. So what's changed? Why has our outlook been extended? Well, first off, uh, in February we had, or excuse me, in March, we had our uh, annual Federal Reserve Bureau uh, data, historical data revision. This is where they take a look at the assumptions they've made about the U.S. economy uh, and some of the, the measuring metrics that they've implemented over the past two or three years, and they, they revise them and they tweak them. Um, normally, there's not a huge change to the data when this happens. Uh, this year, it wasn't uh, extreme. We did see some, uh, some of those data trends tweaked up and tweaked down, uh, and ultimately, we're going to eke out a little bit more positivity for 2018 as compared to what we were looking at last year, uh, or even last quarter. So our Phase B expectations for industrial production uh, has been extended to 3Q18. Uh, that's good news for everyone in this room. Uh, 2018 is generally shaping up to just be overall a little bit stronger than before this data revision. However, it is important that while being more aggressive this year, while positioning yourself to take hold of some of that growth and really uh, translate that economic growth into sales growth or revenue growth, continue to plan for a 2019 recession. 
while we have upgraded our outlook for 2018, our outlook for 2019 and beyond is largely unchanged. In addition to uh, some of the positivity that came out of that Federal Reserve data revision, there were also a few key leading indicators that were signaling we get, might get a little more rise and a little more run out of the industrial sector uh, than we had previously expected. Here you can see the U.S. total industry capacity utilization rate 112, uh, which is essentially a metric that just tries to determine how hot the U.S. economy is running, how much of our capital equipment is being implemented and is being used at any given time. Uh, you can see it's currently in a very robust phase B trend. Uh, it's in that accelerating growth trend. And with the six to nine month uh, lead time, it's signaling rise in the U.S. economy through at least the third quarter of 2018. That was one of the major metrics that suggested that that second quarter inflection point in U.S. industrial production wasn't going to take hold. Similar, uh, another major leading indicator for the U.S. economy we have is U.S. corporate profits. Uh, and you can see that di uh, dissimilar to that phase B trend, U.S. corporate profits have turned over into that slowing growth, that phase C trend. And they're also signaling a third quarter of 2018 peak as well as uh, cyclical decline, that phase C weakening trend in the Wilshire total market cap, which is a measure of stock market activity, is also suggesting a third quarter peak in the industrial production 1212. So when we make revisions to our outlook or when we're discussing our outlook in general, uh, it's important that you don't have to take our word for it. Instead, we back up our outlook, we back up our view of the trajectory of the economy with these leading indicators. And it's important to remember that these leading indicators aren't constructed via uh, forecast methods or statistical uh, forecasting, anything like that. These are actual real-world, real-time economic data points talking about what is happening in the U.S. economy right now. So we can say with a strong degree of confidence that despite the positivity we're seeing right now in the U.S. economy, by late 2018, by that third quarter, we will reach a tipping point and the business environment is going to become progressively less and less favorable. Another major benchmark for the U.S. economy we have is U.S. non-defense capital goods, new orders without aircraft. Um, all this kind of slurry of words is signifying is uh, U.S. capital investment, B2B activity within the U.S. Uh, again, in a very robust, sustained Phase B accelerating growth trend, uh, capital investment is up about 6.5% year over year. Um, after a relatively significant slide in most of 2014, 2015, and 2016. Now, new orders are a dollar-denominated series, and a lot of the rise that we saw in 2017 and that we see right now in 2018 coming out of the B2B sector is largely due to an appreciating commodity price environment. Uh, inflation has been kick-started, and if we look back to about 2015, 2016, that dip in a wide variety of industrial commodity prices uh, that we have, zinc, copper, aluminum, steel, kind of some of the benchmark names, uh, you can see that coincided with the oil and gas crash, and overall just a very large pullback in capital investment. Uh, the pricing point in the U.S. economy was low enough that returns on investment were being threatened on large pieces of capital equipment, and purchasing managers basically stopped buying new pieces of equipment. They stopped upgrading those factories, and we got into a, a fairly steep, prolonged lull. However, you can see now zinc up 23%, copper 15%, aluminum 12.7%, steel 3.3%. Whenever you see those double-digit, you know, low single-digit growth rates on, uh, on industrial commodity prices, you know that we have transitioned to an inflationary environment, and that higher pricing point is stimulating a lot of growth within the U.S. Act, uh, US economy. But now, we can't talk commodity prices without talking a little bit about the, the recent news coming out of the White House uh, and coming out of the Chinese administration with tariffs, trade, and protectionism. Um, obviously, we levied a 25% tariff on imported Chinese uh, raw steel, as well as a 15% tariff uh, on aluminum. Uh, and that's going to help kickstart that steel prices uh, 312 that we were looking at. You can see scrap prices down here kind of lagging behind the other industrial commodity prices at 3.3% compared to the same quarter in 2017. However, uh, since the start of the year, so since uh, January 1st, 2018, steel scrap prices are, almost, are, are already up almost 20%. Uh, 
um, compared to the start of the year. And with these new tariffs in place, coupled with the strong economic rise that we're seeing, we expect to eke out a few more percentage points of rise in that, in that steel uh, Jan 1st to current um, pricing environment. So look for steel to rise to about 25% higher, maybe 27% higher than where it was at the start of the year, and generally appreciate throughout the year. But you can see this relatively well-defined phase C trend in the commodity pricing environment. Most other industrial metals, uh, as well as oil and natural gas, our major uh, energy commodities, uh, are in that phase C trend. And we're going to see some mild appreciation through the second quarter of 2018 before mostly just flatlining or declining very slightly through the end of the year. This is largely in line with our structural expectations of cyclical decline for the overall U.S. economy by year end. Um, when we talk about commodity price decline by year end, it's important you don't think back to 2014 and 2015 uh, with the oil and gas crash. This is more just a cyclical transition uh, that is naturally tied to lower consumer and industrial demand as opposed to any structural imbalances uh, within our country or within the uh, global economy abroad. But so moving back to tariffs, uh, the U.S., the White House recently announced um, tariffs totaling uh, $100 billion worth of goods coming in from China. Um, China recently hit back with $50 billion worth of goods uh, moving into China. And it looks like we may be getting ourselves into a little bit of a trade war here. That's concerning in the long run, but it's important to note that uh, total U.S. exports into the Chinese economy only total about $115, $120 billion of goods or so. So with the U.S. upping the ante to about $100 billion worth of tariffs on incoming goods, the Chinese government really doesn't have any more leeway to increase the amount of goods they're placing tariffs upon uh, simply because of the trade imbalance between China and the U.S. Uh, the U.S. is a much larger consumer of Chinese goods than China is a consumer of U.S. goods. The U.S. products being hit uh, most uh, severely by these tariffs uh, going into China are, are going to be aircraft, steel, soy, uh, a few other agricultural products like sorghum. Um, but largely, while the tariffs are relatively broad across the board, these three components are going to be the ones that are going to be hit the hardest and will see uh, likely the, the biggest economic shock domestically. Outside of those industries, the near-term risks of this burgeoning trade war uh, for the economy abroad are largely going to be uh, higher inflation. Um, we expect to see a generally higher pricing point for uh, consumer goods and industrial goods. And as that inflation uh, metric kick starts, rising interest rates. Um, we're already in a rising interest rate environment. Uh, and any deepening of this trade war, any deepening of these tariffs between the U.S. and China will only exacerbate the pace at which the Fed likely, likely raises interest rates. Long-term risks, talking more the, the two, three, four-year outlook, uh, if things continue to get bad, if the administrations continue to double down on their protectionist agenda versus each other, well, like I said, the U.S. can continue to place tariffs upon the upwards of $500 billion of goods that come in from China, but China largely has their hands tied with the relatively small portion of goods flowing out there. If this trade war deepens, and hopefully it doesn't because I challenge any of you to find a situation in history uh, when there was an overall winner in a trade war. Uh, we haven't been able to find one. Uh, I can't think of any off the top of my head for sure. Longer term risks, really the only power China has at striking back at us punitively uh, is either by stop buying or uh, beginning to sell U.S. debt. Um, that could really cripple the U.S. dollar in the long run, uh, really exacerbate the demand for U.S. money. Uh, and our international financing situation would be, would be very tough if China even really just pulled back on the pace at which they buy U.S. debt. Um, again, would, in that situation, which is basically a worst case situation, um, we definitely see uh, a weakening dollar, ballooning interest rates, and a just generally a less favorable business environment within the U.S., especially when dealing with uh, nations abroad. As far as that trade war goes, well, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, again, a lot of this is still in motion. It's really breaking news. 
Um, and we'll have to see where both the Trump administration uh, and the Chinese administration decides to draw the line as far as a trade war goes. Stepping back a little bit from the industrial sector and the industrial commodities that we're looking at, um, we can take a look at U.S. GDP, gross domestic product, to see how the most holistic capture of the U.S. economy do is doing. Uh, and again, very similar, uh, similarly excuse me, to U.S. industrial production, GDP is growing at a 2.5% annualized rate, uh, rising to a record high of about $17.5 trillion. Uh, again, we're looking at that inflation rate sometime in the late second quarter, early third quarter of 2018, before the U.S. economy slows to that phase C trend overall. But 2018 is still going to be positive. We're going to finish the year up about 1.6%. Before those growth rates tick down and kind of waffle around the zero line for the majority of 2019. The major difference, the major dichotomy or uh, diverging trends within the U.S. economy is going to be in 2019 as we saw the industrial sector is moving toward a mild economic recession while GDP as a whole is going to contract. There's going to be some downward movement, some sideways movement but we're likely not going to get the two consecutive quarters of decline in the GDP uh, that is enough to warrant calling this a technical economic recession. So growth will largely halt in 2019, but 2019 uh, by year end as a whole is going to be mildly positive, up about a percent compared to 2018. And then once again in 20, uh, 2020 and beyond, growth will be kick-started and we're back to the front side of another positive macroeconomic business cycle. Now, why that disparity between the industrial sector and overall GDP? Well, it's important to look at what GDP is made up of. About 16% of the U.S. economy is business investment. Um, that's that non-defense capital goods, new orders uh, kind of segment we were looking at. Uh, government spending accounts for about another 17%, and then 67%, over two-thirds of the U.S. economy, is U.S. personal consumption personal consumption being the Snickers and Coca-Colas and coffees and iPhones that you and I buy in our personal lives, divorced from our corporate activity. So really, as the consumer goes, so goes the U.S. economy as a whole. And right now, the consumer is doing pretty well. Here you can see we have a chart of U.S. private sector employment. Uh, employment is currently growing in a slowing growth trend, but up about 1.8% year over year. However, job openings are in a very robust phase B, up over 5% year over year. So what's important to note here is that job openings are growing about two and a half times as fast as we can fill them. And that to you should say a tightening labor market. And that's why we're seeing these very low unemployment figures right now. Uh, this tight labor market has been very, very good to the U.S. consumer. But there are some downsides to it as well. The quit rate is rising. People are confident in their ability to find a job, and they are job hopping. Uh, but aside from that, uh, you know, with those uh, higher levels of employment, um, the U.S. consumer is largely doing what it does best, and that's getting paid and instantly spending that money. Here you can see we have U.S. retail sales, excluding gas stations. Uh, and that might seem a little strange. The reason we exclude gas stations from this figure is because the relatively low gas prices we're enjoying right now actually act as a negative indicator uh, when you look at retail sales, whereas in fact, in reality, we all know that low gas prices are good for the consumer. So we're just accounting for that little mismatch in what we're measuring. Once again, uh, retail sales up at record levels, phase B accelerating growth trend up about 4% year over year, um, very healthy, and if you're, cons if you're tied to this consumer sector, if you sell more in the B2C markets than B2B markets, you're likely going to link better to that GDP figure, which is going to avoid a recession in 2019, than that industrial figure, which is going to feel uh, marginally more pain next year. You can see here uh, a broad measure of, of retail sales segments are all experiencing growth. Uh, from health and personal care stores at a relatively mild, relatively weak 1%, um, up to jewelry at 6 building materials and gardening supplies 7.5%, uh, 8%, and online retailers blowing everyone out of the water at 11% year-over-year -year growth. Now, and it's important when we look at those online retailers, everyone knows about the Amazon effect, um, everyone knows about the emergence and the dominance of e-commerce and, and the consumer's day-to-day -day life, 
But it's important to note that, and this is a, a lesser known figure, that while e-commerce is dominating the retail sector, business to business e-commerce actually accounts for about twice the activity of business to consumer activity. So the B2B e-commerce space is very robust, it's growing at a similar rate. Uh, and what that should be saying to you is whether you play in the B2C space or the B2B space, it's time for you to stop thinking of yourself as either a brick and mortar retailer or an e-commerce retailer and start realizing that as the years go on in the next one, five, ten years, the line between traditional brick and mortar and e-commerce is going to become more and more blurred as they largely converge. And if you don't already have an online presence or if you don't have a uh, brick and mortar domestic presence, it's time to start thinking about how you can have some low effort investments that bridge that gap between e-commerce and brick and mortar. Because that's one of the large scale trends that we're seeing both in the B2B and the B2C space. However, despite the overwhelming positivity in these figures and that 4% uh, headline growth rate, there are some areas of weakness primarily light vehicle sales, excluding trucks. Trucks are doing pretty well in automotive parts stores. Uh, the automotive sector as a whole is one of the risk sectors that we're monitoring as we move into this 2019 recessionary period. Uh, and largely, U.S. consumers are moving away from buying new cars at a fast pace. They're doing more with less. They're seeing them as uh, pieces of equipment that perform a job as opposed to a luxury good that you want to buy for uh, a status or a brand effect. Um, and because of that, the auto industry is very oversupplied and very over leveraged right now. Um, up here in New Hampshire, where we're based at ITR, there's a, a jingle that's on the radio all the time um, for one of the, the largest regional car dealers. And they're offering, I believe it's, if you bring home $400 a week before taxes, we'll give you up to $40,000 toward a new car loan with zero down. Now, I'm not a car salesman, uh, I'm not a lender, but that should be concerning when you're talking about $400 a week for a $40,000 car loan. Uh, that should start you know, to, to harken back to the 2006, 2000 and Sarah, uh, 2007, excuse me, uh, bubble spending era. And definitely, if they don't start to police themselves, uh, could bode very poorly for the automotive sector moving into 2019. One of the drivers behind uh, the very healthy retail spending we're seeing in the U.S. economy right now um, is rising wages uh, due to that tight labor market condition. Uh, again, here you can see the growth rates on a monthly raw data basis. They're currently up about 2.9%, not quite at the 3% mark. And overall, if you want to deal with that rising quit rate, if you want to deal with people job hopping, and you really want to max out your retention for 2018 and into 2019 as well, you should be planning for 3% wage inflation at least, more so for your key players who you'd have difficulty replacing. Now, while this is largely positive, uh, that 3% growth rate is outpacing inflation, meaning real wages are rising, there are some cracks beginning to show on the consumer sector of the U.S. economy. As you can see, while, again, 2.9% wage inflation is fairly healthy, it's down over 100 basis points from the beginning of 2017, when we saw about 4% wage growth. We're on the backside of that business cycle, and as we see these labor conditions equilibrate, people won't be enjoying the same pace of wage growth as they're seeing right now. And that's concerning because at the same time, we're seeing U.S. personal savings absolutely plummet. This top line number you can see on the top of your screen, that 15% quarterly growth rate and 20, negative 26%, um, annual growth rate is the rate of change of U.S. personal savings. So in the last year, they've declined by over 25%, which should be concerning in itself. Uh, but then if you look down bottom, we have the total U.S. dollar value of personal savings, currently at about $474 billion, And you can see that is less than half of where we were just back to 2012. And we're approaching the pre-recession peak uh, of about $400 billion. Uh, very concerning. Uh, fewer personal savings, again, go to show that while the consumer is doing well in the moment and they are spending and they are buying and they are greasing the wheels of economic growth, they are also leveraging themselves and making themselves more vulnerable to any potential downturn and any potential rise in that unemployment rate that we tend to see during recessionary periods. Compounding that fact, we can see that delinquency rates and consumer loans are also rising. 
Um, similarly to uh, personal savings that peaked in 2012, 2014, uh, we saw a trough in delinquency rates, a low in 2014, and they've been rising ever since. This is on personal consumer loans and also credit card delinquency. They're both up around 2.5% or so. Now, a, a nascent burgeoning risk factor for the U.S. consumer, but no reason to panic yet. You can see both uh, consumer credit and credit card delinquency are both below their 10-year average. So again, there's still time to turn this around. And with all of the economic growth that we're seeing in 2018 right now, uh, if that consumer does kind of pull back in their spending habits, tighten up their purse strings a little bit, uh, and begin saving again, we could likely mitigate some of the consumer weakness that we're seeing moving into 2019. But now, uh, regardless of uh, the recessionary pressures in 2019 and how exposed the consumers are, uh, you can always count on beer, wine, and liquor store sales to get you through a recession. Uh, last time in over 25 years that we had even a mild recession in the liquor space was uh, after the tech bubble crashed in 2001. Um, and they weren't even drinking less alcohol, they were just drinking cheaper alcohol. So if you're looking for a real recession-proof industry, uh, it's either beer, wine, and liquor, or maybe cat food. And again, as we mentioned before, commodity prices are appreciating, likely to do so through most of 2018. Wages are rising, labor costs are rising, and that's kickstarting inflation. Uh, here in orange, you can see we have the consumer price index, and that's a measure of price rise as you and I feel it, again, for those Twinkies and those iPhones in our personal life. Uh, but more importantly for you as business leaders, we have in blue the U.S. producer price index, which measures inflation for producers of goods. Uh, the U.S. producer price index, PPI, is currently outpacing the CPI, 2.7 uh, for producers, about 2.2% for consumers, Look for that to rise into late 2018 before those pricing effects begin to diminish late this year into next year. So any pricing issues that you've been dealing with, especially if steel or aluminum uh, or imported Chinese goods are a major cost driver for you, if you've been having profitability issues, if you've been seeing your bottom line threatened by increasing uh, costs, you're going to have to find a way to continuously pass on those price increases uh, to your consumers really through the majority of 2018. And as inflation is rising, obviously the dual mandate of the Federal Reserve is to control inflation and interest rates. Uh, and we have seen uh, historically low interest rates over the past six or seven years uh, since the, or almost a decade now, uh, since the 2008 recession with the quantitative easing that the Fed was playing with. However, that has begun to turn around. We are seeing yields start to rise, interest rates start to rise. Um, not quite sure what they're going to do next. Luckily, we have a hard and fast forecasting method. All you do is line up our uh, Fed chairman and chairwomen by their tenure. If they're getting shorter and shorter, interest rates are going down. Luckily, we know Jeremy Powell is about six and a half feet tall, so interest rates have to be going up. But you don't have to listen to us for it. We can ask the Federal Reserve themselves. Uh, here we have the Federal Open Market Committee member interest rate projections. So each one of these dots for each year um, is one of the members of the Federal Reserve who is responsible for uh, targeting interest rates and where they expect interest rates to be in 2017, 18, 19, 2020, and beyond. These blue dots were them being pulled as of 3Q17. And you can see they expect to rise into the 2% range in 2018 before hitting about 3% in 2019 and beyond. When they were pulled at the close of 2017, you can see very little changed. Uh, we're still expecting 3% interest rates by the end of 2019 in the long term as well. Um, likely a healthy thing for the U.S. economy getting back to, to fiscal normalness, uh, fiscal normalcy, but it does bring with it a, a pricier cost of doing business. Uh, in, in addition to rising labor costs, in addition to rising input costs, you will have to be dealing with these rising borrowing costs moving to the 2019 recessionary period as well. So largely good things uh, for the U.S. economy moving throughout 2018. The 2019 period is going to bring with it some weakness, uh, some managerial uh, hurdles that you have to pass, especially if you're tied to the industrial sector as opposed to the consumer sector. Uh, but overall, no serious points of weakness for the U.S. economy over the next two to three years. 
but there are some lingering long-term concerns. Once again, that developing, burgeoning trade war with China. Uh, still in development, um, nothing is finalized yet. Stay tuned to hear what we here at ITR have to say in the coming weeks and the coming months. Um, positive business cycle problems, wages are rising, retention is going to continue being an issue, and costs in general are going to be going up through 2018. If you don't deal with that, you risk running into that uh, profitless prosperity issue that we've talked a little bit about in previous months, uh, and that's the last thing you want, knowing that there is a mild recessionary period in 2019 where it would help to have cash on hand. Couple that with some slowing growth in developing nations, uh, and we're really talking about your brick here, your Brazil, Russia, India, China. Um, Russia, India, China specifically have seen growth rates that are, are very subdued compared to what they saw even a decade ago, and they likely won't be growing at a robust enough pace to help carry us through any cyclical weakness next year. And then finally, in the longer term, U.S. debt and world demographics, uh, the CBO uh, just raised their uh, budgetary deficit for the U.S. to $1 trillion by 2020, and we are moving toward a crisis point in the late 2020s, early 2030s. Couple that with uh, world demographics, population demographics, that are skewing toward the older side, uh, a very, very aging population in the EU, China, especially Japan. Uh, to, to drive that point home, a, a funny anecdote I heard about Japan is they set a record in 2017 uh, that was the first year in history that I know of where they sold more adult diapers than they did infant diapers. Uh, and again, you don't have to be an economist to know that that does not bode well for a robust, youthful, vigorous workforce in the decades to come. But now let's move away from the macro and, and jump into a, a few of the, the niche sectors that we're looking at for PMMI. And now when we look at the industry drivers here, it's important to notice that, that uh, historical data revision that the uh, U.S. industrial production figures were subject to also are affecting uh, the majority of these industries found in the PMMI report. In your next quarterly update, uh, your quarterly report provided by ITR, you will see the finalized uh, forecasts for these industries accounting for that mild historical data revision. Uh, U.S. food and food preparation production, again, this is all processed food, basically any kind of food, including meat that touches machinery other than transportation at any point. Uh, currently ripping up about 4% year over year, phase B accelerating growth trend. Uh, an imminent slowdown is coming, uh, coming, phase C is going to characterize most of 2018 uh, with the year closing out up about not quite 2%. 2019 also going to be positive, up about 2%. No weakness in the next three years as far as food production goes. Uh, as we saw earlier, the U.S. consumer is making money. They love to spend money, and more so than anything, except maybe beer and wine, as we saw, the U.S. consumer loves to spend money on food, and they will continue to do that over the next three years. If you sell into the food sector, uh, you're going to have to grapple with some slowing growth rates, but nothing overtly negative. Similar outlook for U.S. beverages, coffee, and tea production, not quite as rapid a pace of rise. Also in a phase B accelerating growth trend, up about 1.7% year over year. Uh, going to accelerate through year end, 2018 finishing up 3%, uh, before slowing to about half a percentage to one percentage point in 2019. Again, at less than 1% growth uh, for some periods in 2019, depending on where you're looking in the beverage, coffee, and tea space, this sector may begin to feel recessionary, but overall plan for general, albeit mild, growth through 2018, 19, and into 2020. Uh, major period of weakness that drove the recession last year was uh, other beverage production. Um, not including beer, wine, and distilled liquors. We're talking sodas, uh, any, any processed non-water drink. Uh, that was in a relatively deep recession. Just now coming up to the zero line, just now we're beginning to see some growth, and that's what's going to drive that phase B accelerating growth trend through year end. Now we move on to some of the, uh, the more dour outlooks for this report. Uh, pharmaceutical and medical device production currently in a phase D this industry is running just below our expectations. It's really having trouble kicking itself into gear. 
uh, largely as the conversation around uh, long-term health care spending has been uh, very nebulous and very undefined. However, we do expect an imminent Phase D to Phase A transition, not going to see any growth until late, late in 2018, when we'll be up about 2.1%. Uh, but again, the period of growth is going to be mild. We're largely going to plateau and oscillate around the zero line for the majority of 2019. Uh, growth prospects for this sector aren't looking good until 2020 and beyond. So if you're playing in the medical device space, 2018, 2019, there's going to be some respite, but largely driving growth in this sector is going to be a story of market share, market share, market share. Similarly, but to a lesser extent, U.S. personal care products production, it has made that phase D to phase A transition. We are in that light at the end of the tunnel phase. Um, marginally more growth in 2018. The se whole second half of the year is going to be positive, finishing up about 2.4% uh, uh, year over year. But again, 2019 as a whole is likely going to be a wash. Similarly uh, with 2020, where we'll get up to about 2.3% year over year growth. Uh, it's showing a 0% for 20, uh, 2020 here. That is a mistake. Uh, please don't be too overtly concerned about three years of no growth in the sector. Uh, but what is important, again, that consumer who has money to spend um, is responding well in the consumer healthcare uh, sector. This is things that you're going to find at uh, retail pharmacies, uh, CVS, Walgreens, and the like. Uh, and once you see some of that growth taking hold in the consumer uh, health sector, you know that the institutional health sector is likely going to be about a quarter behind. Chemicals and cleaning products production, uh, phase B accelerating growth trend up not quite 3% year over year. That phase B is going to persist into the fourth quarter of 2018. Uh, finishing the year up about 5% year over year, so some solid growth product uh, prospects in the cleaning sector. Uh, before 2019 as a whole is going to be characterized by that phase C, but with its ties to the commercial sector, again, we're going to be see, seeing more of a soft landing, uh, more of that low 1%, maybe 0% growth at times for this sector throughout 2019. Uh, and again, 2020 looking good for the front side of that business cycle to really kick these growth rates in the butt. Durables, hard goods, components, and parts, uh, perhaps one of the more vague names for an economic data series, um, and there's not much we can do about that, but basically uh, durables, hard goods, components, and parts are any materials, uh, consumer goods, or pieces of equipment that are meant to last for two to three years or more. Um, these are things like automotive parts, uh, airplane parts, on the consumer sector we have um, furniture, computers, uh, appliances, household fixtures, and it's going to be that consumer sector, especially tied to the single uh, single unit housing market, uh, those those beds, that furniture, um, personal computers, fixtures, large appliances. That's what's going to be driving that phase B accelerating growth trend for much of 2018. Um, after years of the older generations griping about the millennial generation, um, and I consider myself a part of that millennial generation, for better or worse, depending on who you ask, um, we are finally starting to begin buying houses en masse, uh, and so that demand for household appliances is going to help give some lift over the next year, year and a half to this sector. We are looking at a technical recession in 2019 with an upside risk of just about flatlining for the year. Um, but overall, again, that weakness is going to be tied more toward the, uh, the manufacturing sector in the automotive sector as opposed to the retail consumer sector in 2019. So if you are able to shift your focus between the consumer and the industrial over the next two years, begin focusing on the consumer sector as we move toward 2019. Now we'll take a moment to look at what's happening abroad. And you can see, just like we're looking at that inflection point in the U.S. economy, that phase B to phase C slowing growth transition later this year, if we look at the majority of the global leading indicators, the Eurozone um, manufacturing PMI, the total EU PMI, the J.P. Morgan global manufacturing PMI, uh, forget specifics, forget growth rates, they have all turned the corner to that phase C slowing growth trend. 
So the same trend, that inflection point, that slowing growth period, that worsening of business conditions that we're expecting for the U.S. is also going to be affecting Asia. It's going to be affecting much of South America and the Eurozone as a whole. So we're not going to be able to rely on demand from uh, international economies to help kind of drag us through this 2019 period. They're largely going to be following suit. As of now, though, the global economy is doing very well. Um, on the next few heat maps that we'll be looking at, we'll be looking at uh, industrial production by country. The more green we are, the more positive. Uh, the more red we are, the more negative. Canada up 5%, U.S. up 2.5%. Um, both countries responding very well to rising natural gas, rising oil prices, uh, as well as just a general inflationary environment. Uh, Mexico dealing with a lot of uncertainty about the future of long-term investment from the U.S. in their country, down less than 1%, growth prospects to return by year-end, but definitely not going, to be a, uh, not going to be a rising star over the next year. South America, one of the weakest regions in the world we're looking at right now, a uh, lot of red, a lot of mild growth. Uh, the main driver of growth in the region, Brazil, up 2.7%. Um, but that's a little misleading based off the depths of the industrial recession they've, they're coming out of with the, the Petrobras scandal and, and the, the natural gas and oil crash. 2% uh, growth off of a very low, low line is not going to feel like much if you're involved in this market. Weakness is going to persist through 2019 for Brazil uh, if you are either tied to their demand or selling directly into their country. The EU doing very well, uh, growth taking hold in the less developed Eastern European uh, region than it is in the West, but largely green across the board. Um, good to see the UK up at about 1.9%, which is lackluster but still positive given some of the weakness uh, that we saw in their financial markets last year based around the, uh, the Brexit speculation and some na uh, nascent protectionism. Uh, the Scandinavian countries just now recovering from the oil and natural gas crunch. Uh, but again, overall, we're looking at phase B for much of 2019 before things turn down and, and really slow down to null in the 2019 time period as far as the EU is concerned. More green here when we look at Asia. China up 6.5%, India 4%, Australia lagging behind at about one2 uh, but it's important to note while all of these countries are expanding on a year-over-year -year basis, the growth rate that we're seeing right now in China, about 6%, is less than half of the growth rates that we were seeing only about five years ago in 2013. So while 6.5% sounds good, for a developing nation like China, it's really not enough to get us excited, and it's not a fast enough pace of growth for China to be able to carry us through any potential recessionary periods and really give uh, kind of bolster international demand. Similar with India, uh, we're seeing low single digit growth. Uh, best case scenario to help mitigate some of the weakness we're seeing next year, would like to see high single digits, maybe even low double digits growth in India and China. Uh, but right now, structurally, it's looking like that's not going to happen. And so that slower growth trend in a lot of uh, the major uh, developing nations that we're seeing is really going to be concentrated in this China, Indochina region um, for 2019 especially, but also beyond until they find a way to, to really reignite and reorient their markets to, to enjoy the growth rates that we were seeing about a decade ago. Now, it's not enough to know uh, what is going to happen. You have to know what to do about it and what is going to happen. Uh, so I've listed some managerial objectives for you here uh, that we have had up for almost a year now. All of the changes in the U.S. economy over the last few months only heighten the fact that you have to use this period of rise, this period of phase B into 3Q18 to your advantage. Uh, Economic growth periods of acceleration reward risk takers. Really expose yourself to some new opportunities in 2018. Uh, use the last half of the year to build up your cash reserves and position yourself to either weather that period of slower growth if you're tied to GDP or that recessionary period if you're tied to USIP in 2019. Now, we're coming up on time now, so uh, I want you all to, to kind of internalize these and disseminate these uh, managerial objectives within your company, um, but I'm not going to go through them all. Instead, uh, Rebecca, I'm going to turn it over to you to see if we have any questions. 
Thank you, Chris, for the great reflection of the current economy and the issues at hand for the packaging and processing industry. Uh, we do actually have a couple of questions. Uh, the first question is, um, most of us, and that's the people attending the webinar, produce capital equipment. If capacity utilization is forecast to decline, uh, what is the reason for that? Is it possibly because people will be using newer or faster equipment? So there's a, there's a two-prong answer here. Uh, first off, the, the main reason that uh, capacity utilization is going to decline later in this year uh, into 2019 is basically going to be a, a tick down in aggregate demand. Um, we're going to be seeing less demand internationally and also the U.S. market are basically just transitioning to the back half of that business cycle. Now, as far as your intuition about uh, smarter equipment and equipment doing more with less, um, that's going to be a double-edged sword. If you supply these kind of uh, AI-oriented pieces of equipment, these, uh, these smart, more technologically-oriented pieces of equipment, you're likely going to see some prolonged demand over you know, the next one, five, ten years in general. That's the trend of the U.S. economy. But if you supply more traditional, uh, low-tech pieces of equipment in a market that is being impacted by AI, you're likely going to be a shift in preference away from utilization of your goods to these new burgeoning goods. Okay, and uh, thank you for that. And uh, we do have another question. Um, the question is, um, will the effects of the recession impact this industry, packaging and processing, in the earlier in the economic cycle than for other industries? Um, likely not. With, with the amount of uh, different verticals that are uh, involved in the packaging and processing industry, um, really you're likely going to be able to assume you're, you're right around the median expectations of a mid-2019 trough um, for this recession. Uh, again, largely if you're more tied to, uh, to, to consumer products and personal products, uh, those amplitudes will be less negative. And if you're more uh, tied to industrial packaging, uh, those amplitudes are going to be more negative. Okay, thank you for that. Um, also, on uh, the slide showing growth uh, in Asia, it shows that Singapore has an 11.4% growth rate. Um, any idea what's driving that? It's uh, partially just the overall rise in a relatively small economy in Asia is going to see uh, very large swings in their growth rates as opposed to you know, something like China or, or the U.S. that are these massive institutions. Uh, but overall, we, we have a feeling that there's a lot of trade going through Singapore, uh, through some other countries like Vietnam from China in order to avoid tariffs in the U.S., but also tariffs in other countries as well. Uh, China has a long history of trying to, to skirt or, or flout um, WTO rulings on where goods come from, and a lot of times uh, that kind of pass-through demand can really bolster demand uh, within some of those kind of gateway or harbor countries. Great, thank you for that. Um, that's all the questions we have right now. If anyone has further questions, please feel free to type them into the text box at the bottom left of your screen. And we'll give a moment just in case anyone else has any questions. And while we wait for that, uh, Rebecca, as always, I just want to let, uh, let all of your members know um, that they can submit any questions they have after the fact to you, and you can forward them uh, over to me, or they can email them directly to questions at itreconomics.com, um, and either me or the team will get back to them in the days to come. Thank you, Chris. And, and if anybody, I mean, please feel free to email Chris and team directly, but if for some reason you forget the email or, or something, you can always feel free to um, email either myself at rmarquez at pmmi.org or Paula Feldman, um, and we will be sure to get those questions over to Chris and his team. Just out of curiosity, Chris, has anybody started um, conversations about the proposed new Silk Road? Um, I, I haven't been discussing that specifically. Um, if that's something that you and your members are uh, kind of uh, muttering about internally, um, we, can, we can definitely start putting together uh, kind, of, kind of an outlook or, or an opinion piece on that. Okay. 
just just curious about that. And it looks like we don't have any further questions. Let me just make sure. And we have no further questions. Um, I think we can conclude, Chris, on behalf of PMMI. Thank you for participating today. Um, as a final note for everyone who uh, logged on, uh, you will receive an email to complete an evaluation on today's webinar. We really would like to know um, how we're doing. And so completing this webinar, or excuse me, completing this evaluation does let us know that. Please complete it as soon as possible. It will only take a moment of your time. Um, and le just let us know how we can improve. Um, and uh, as well, um, this webinar will be posted on PMMI.org uh, tomorrow. So for anyone who wants to review anything that we went over, uh, you may just visit pmmi.org slash webinars and uh, view the webinar that way. Um, thank you so much, Chris. This has been really great. Yeah, thank you all for coming, and uh, enjoy your week. Enjoy your week, everyone.